Welcome to Soul Winning School. And I know a lot of you guys are already soul winners, but um, I'm going to go over some basic principles. I'm not going to go over the entire presentation. Um, we're going to do the beginning and ending, but I want to get some important things about, about your introduction. And, and as I start the introduction, I'm going to show you how I do it and why I do it, but I want to, I want to tell you some things beforehand. Um, and it's very important as you start to ask questions. There's information you have to get from people, so, and I call it a tied down. And what I mean by that is I'm asking what they believe, if they're really saved, what they're trusting in to get to heaven, so that I can tie them down and come back to that. A lot of soul winners, and I've seen very good soul winners, that they get to the end of their presentation and they try to, okay, well then let me pray with you, and they're like, for what? I'm already saved. Right, yeah. Well, but you thought you could, you know, no, you need to. So it's very important to get a tie down. And I do it when, when I'm asking people the questions of, you know, what they think they have to do to go to heaven. That's the time to be quiet. It's very important to learn when to be silent in your presentation. You ask a question and you stop and you be silent and you wait for them to respond. Otherwise, you lose. If you, if that uncomfortable silence, that awkward silence, if you just feel so uncomfortable, you have to talk, then you've given up your right to be in charge of the conversation because then you're making excuses. You're going to give them a suggestion and it's not really from them. You want to hear it from them and you be patient and you wait for them to answer. And then I'll be, and I'll show you how, but if they don't initially give you good answers, you can ask questions to get those answers. But what do you think you have to do to go to heaven? You know? Just in your opinion, what do you think someone has to do to go to heaven? And you wait for the answer. You've got to get that answer. You be quiet until you get it. But whenever they say what they're going to say, uh, just believe. Oh, okay, believe. Okay. Repeat what they say. Right. And then be quiet again. Oh, okay, believe. And then a lot of people will say, well, and do works, or and go to church. Even if they just say, uh, repent and be baptized. Oh, okay, repent and be baptized. And if they don't say anything, give it, give it a minute. Be, be quiet for a second. Anything else? Um, I don't know. Okay. What do you think maybe you have to uh, keep the commandments? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to keep the commandments. So you can start asking some leading questions, but, you know, don't make it too obvious. Um, sometimes you can, well, do you think works have anything to do with it? Oh, no. Do you think you have to keep the commandments? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> you know, because most people don't, don't understand, you know, because the, the Lordship salvation versus repenting your sins, it's the same thing. Right. But, oh, no, we're not Lordship salvation, brother, but you better, if you're really saved, you're going to turn from all your sins. Well, wait a minute, well, it's the same thing. And people don't see it because they recognize one label, but this repenting your sins has snuck in. And that is, I mean, 95% of the people you talk to, they're trusting in their works and they don't see it. At, they wouldn't just say, well, I'm trusting in my good works to get to heaven. Now, those that will and are that bold about it, you know, they're probably harder to get saved because they're adamant. They've been taught that. They believe it. They, it's ingrained in them. Now, some people may have a knee-jerk reaction and just say that by default. Oh, well, I think, you know, you have to be good. You know, that's like going to be their answer if you catch them off guard because they've heard it for years. So the main part of your introduction you know, are, are, is asking what happens, where, where they go, what they're trusting, and getting these details so you can tie them down to it and go back to it. I always go back to it at the end, but when I get about 75% of the way through my presentation, to check myself, I will ask them, that's a little bit different than what you told me before, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Because if they say at 75%, no, I think it's all the same, I already believe that. Uh-oh, then I'm, I'm missing something. Right. I'm, let's go back and make sure I've really tied them down. Let's make sure they understand the difference between faith, and you know the definitions of words are very important. People think, Salvation is different, you know, oh yeah, you're saved. Saved from sins. What do you mean by that? Well, you won't sin anymore. Well, that's not what it means. You're saved from the punishment of sin, right? You're, you know, so understanding the difference there, you know, because the flesh versus the soul is another big one. People are trying to get their flesh good enough to get their soul to heaven and they don't even realize that's what they're saying. Because right. really, it's believe in your heart and your soul will go to heaven and that's the promise. There's no guarantee of what your flesh will do. Right. That's your choice every day. You have to choose day by day what you're going to do. So as you go through your soul presentation, you want to have checkpoints. You want to have stopping points where you just, okay, you know, think about it like when you guys do schoolwork or, and I know there's a lot of different curriculum, but usually there's a quiz, right? Let's say the test is at the end 
the quiz comes, you know, well, every few weeks. At the end of the week, we're going to quiz you on what we learned, right? So if, if your first point is you deserve hell for your sin, you have to checkpoint that. If you breeze through that and get to the end of your presentation and they say, well, I don't think I've done anything worthy of hell, then you failed. A checkpoint in the beginning could have saved you a lot of time because that's one of the first bricks in your presentation. You're building a house. Foundation comes first, right? And you don't just start with the roof. You don't start with the walls. You got you to line upon line. You got to put all of this information together. So it's very important to have these checkpoints throughout. These checkpoints are used for troubleshooting, for troubleshooting. I'm a computer guy. If I'm working on a, if you say, hey, my computer won't boot up and you bring it to me, I'm going to check the power. I'm going to check the power supply. I'm going to check the connector to the motherboard. I'm going to check, make sure the processor, I'm going to look at the video card, the RAM, the hard drive. I'm going to go through a series of steps. Okay, well, it's got everything it needs. You know, maybe it's a software problem. Well, let's see, is, it, does it have the operators, the kernel? What about this? What's missing, right? In the same way with an engine. Well, it's just not starting. Well, what's going on with it? Well, it's just not starting. Well, when you turn it, does it make a noise? Right. That's a good question, right? If a mechanic would say, oh, okay, this could be a starter, this could be an alternator, this could be a battery, it could be a bigger problem. And the first question of troubleshooting is, what happens when you turn the key? Because the next question is going to be based on the answer of what happens when you turn the key, right? Oh, yeah, it made, no, 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 no. Okay, good. Next question then is, you know... So you're troubleshooting an individual, and you have to know what they believe. You have to get honest answers out of them. So dialogue is very important. Being personable and asking questions, asking who, what, who, who they are, what's your name. And I always try to checkpoint myself um, on, on that first checkpoint. If I, I try to remember if I've asked their name or not. I'm sorry, I, for, I forgot. My name was Adam. What was your name again? You know, I apologize. What was your name again? Just ask, even if you forgot to ask. You know, in the middle of your presentation, when you realize you don't know their name, get to know their name. All right. That is very important because it's a personal thing. You have to have consistent structure. And everybody's soul winning presentation is probably a little bit different. And I'm not going to say, you need to do it my way. Now, you may go with me soul winning and say, ooh, I like how you did that. I'm going to borrow that. Right. But be careful that it doesn't get so fat and bloated that you've got... Three, you read three verses for one point every time, whether or not they get it. Look, if they get it, move on. Have those three verses in reserve. Get those bullets in your gun in case you need it, right? But you don't always have to give all those verses. Um, if somebody does not believe that Jesus is God, there's a certain process I go through. Now, if they say, of course he's God. Yeah, he's the son of God. He's the savior. He was born of a virgin. If they say those things, I'm like, great. A lot of times they'll even tell you about the Trinity. Great, we're on the same page. I don't have to spend a lot of time there. Now, the most common answer I get is, well, no, he's the Son of God. Now, according to the Scriptures, John 5, John 10, when he claimed to be the Son of God, they picked up stones to stone him because he made himself equal with God. By being the Son of God, that makes him God the Son. And, you know, that's a very important detail. Now, I have these stickers over here. I recommend that you put these in the back of your Bible. This is a little cheat sheet. And what it is, I've got it in clusters of three verses. So the first one, uh, you know, Matthew 1, his name, God with us. So it's an abbreviated, I've got the verses, I've got a bunch of these stickers, I brought them for you guys. Um, I, I just put it in the back of my Bible. So, um, and I don't really use them that much anymore personally because I've gone through them a lot, but it's a cheat sheet. I still need them. Every now and then I'll be like, wait a minute, there was another one, I forget it. Where was that at? I got it right here. Um, and there's more verses than you should have to use. If you have to go through all of these, something's wrong. Okay, and I put them in, in groups of three because three usually work well after the second and third admonition. Um, Acts 7.59, that's one I always use, calling upon God. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And I point at the name Jesus in my Bible, and I put it in their face, and I say, so when he called God, what name did he call God? Amen. And I'd be quiet. If they won't answer and say Jesus or Lord Jesus, you've got a bigger problem there. Right. Okay? Good. So it's it's a test. Well, you, oh, yeah, Jesus. Okay. You know? So I'm going to show them out of the Scriptures. 1 Timothy 3.16, God manifest in the flesh. 1 John 5.7, these three are one. God. I usually say God after I read that. I don't always go to 1 John 5.7 in my presentation, but I almost always quote it. And I explain that these three are one God. Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man in our image. 
We are made like God. And God said us, right? So that's plural. That's the Trinity. That's the Godhead. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says that we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. So your body is all I see, but your soul and your spirit, they're everlasting. They're going to go somewhere forever, and it's based on your choice now. So that, that information is always good. I've got a lot of different verses there. Also about uh, ones that go a little bit deeper, showing that Son of God is God the Son. But usually just by presenting the Trinity, that kind of eliminates that. That knocks that out. And then and at the end, I've got three good verses or passages about how Jesus is the creator. Because everybody believes God created us. And if you show that Jesus is the creator for some people, that just kind of turns the light bulb on. So these stickers are very handy. There's, there's plenty over there. I recommend putting one in your soul winning Bible. Put one in your, in your carrying Bible if you use a different Bible. Um, but you have to have consistent structure and make sure that there's a point that you always get to when you talk about if Jesus is God or not. Now, I personally, I always do it when I go to John 3.16 and I'll begin to talk about who Jesus was. What do you know about Jesus? Okay. And they're asking questions. Well, he did this. He did that. Okay. Um, you, know, he, he, you know, he did this. You know, he did that. So I start filling in the blanks. Uh, let me ask you this. Do you believe Jesus is God? Yes, no, maybe. I deal with it then. Then I come back and finish the verse and I show what he did for us, how he died for us. Um, the fact that he died for our sins and went to hell, which I always, I always put that in my presentation. I do believe that's important because there are a lot of people that are disconnected in their mind about, um, well, what did Jesus do when well, he died on the cross, right? And I'll say, so I'll say what happened, the way I, I typically word it is he died on the cross. They took his body off. They put him in the grave. What happened three days later? He came back to life. He rose again. That's acceptable. I'll explain the resurrection a little bit. If they say he disappeared, you got a problem. Right. Because that is Jehovah's Witness doctrine. The Catholics are teaching this in a, in a strange way because it says they couldn't find the body. So, yeah, he disappeared. Well, no, that's not what it's teaching. They're teaching strange doctrine. They're teaching watered-down doctrine. And that's why even though the Catholics believe in the Trinity, they, are, they emphasize the fact that he's the Son of God in a way that they actually take away from the deity, not instructing that the Son of God means he's God the Son. So there's a point there that needs to be firmed up and strengthened up. Because I've had Catholic, no, no, he's just the Son of God. And then I start to explain the Trinity. Like, well, yeah, the Trinity. And I'm, oh, and you can see it, the, the gears kind of connecting. So you have to connect the information to understand their definitions, see how they're defining words. This is important. So you need to be uh, consistent in the structure of your soul winning presentation, but it also needs to be unique and personal and unique to you and personal in the sense of I'm a robot, answer this question, you know, I'm going to read John 3.16, you know, and if they're not paying attention, you're failing. Right. If they're, I had a guy one time and he's a great soul winner today, but when he first moved to Fort Worth, he was, he, he knew the gospel and he's good. He was just wasn't as good with people. Right. And he's a bulldog. I mean, he's a bulldog. He's, getting into the conversation and this grandma had you know a two and a three and a four year old or something had a couple little kids in there and she's holding the door and fighting him and distracting and he's just like and he's like you know telling her and i'm like i interjected hey oh, what's this one's name hold on just a minute. let's talk i see you got a problem what's going on go ahead and deal with that go ahead i know you need to you know right. talk to them and deal with the kids how many grandbabies do you have change the whole just it, it took the pressure off of her for a second because he was just pounding, you know, hitting her and hitting her and hitting her. Are you paying attention to what I'm saying? And she's like, I, 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 I want to hear this. I, you know, so it, it gave her an opportunity. We Hold on just a second. Go ahead. Get the kids in, in situation. Let's come back. Let's focus. Let's take a breath. Amen. Let's pay attention to what's going on. You need to be personal with the people. You need to ask their name. Um, if they're dealing with something, talk to them. Look, look old IFB is... Oh, wow. What kind of, is that mauve paint? What kind of grass do you guys grow in? Those flowers are beautiful. And they want to talk about the house. And, oh, I see you're a sports, you're a Sooner fan. Cool. All right. That's not what we're about. I could care less. Right? I really do. I, I, I don't, I hate football. <laughs> Let's not get off on that tangent. But I don't care what kind of house they have. What, what if you're in an apartment and they're broke? Hey, that's where the good, good soul in it is. Oh, wow. Did somebody kick your door? You know, you know, how long has that window been broke? You know, do you know there's a crack pipe out in the sidewalk? No, leave it alone. Talk to the people, but be personal with the people. Um, whenever I ask them, you know, where they go to church, I'll, I'll, I'll joke with them. 
I have a little bit of humor in my soul winning presentation because I want to lighten the mode. And I'll show you that in a second as we begin to go through it. Uh, but you need to have consistent structure that's very important because then you know where you're at and where you should be at. And if you get off on a tangent, you know where to come back to. And if you get off answering a question, like reprobates, <laughs> You know you can come back to where you're supposed to. Right. Very important. Or, or about a particular religion or doctrine. Most of those things, it's best to just simply say, well, I tell you what, let me, let me get back to that. Let's focus on this. Right? Because if we're building a house, and I'm, I'm your contractor, and I'm pouring the foundation, I'm out there pouring the foundation, and you're like, and you're asking me, well, the siding that's going to be on the chimney, will it be eggshell or white? Well, there's plenty of time to get to that. Let's get the foundation right first. Good. And then we can do whatever you want with the chimney. You know what I'm saying? Because no. they're dying. Well, I, I need to know right now about the aliens, what aliens are. Okay, look, they're really, they're really devils. Amen. I'll prove it to you from the Bible. They're fallen angels. Let's get back to that later, okay? I promise. We'll talk about it. And a lot of times they'll forget about it. Or, you know, right. I mean, if you, you know, try to answer it if you remember, you know, don't, don't lie to them. Don't be dishonest. But if, they, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If they don't have the foundation of faith alone, you're not going to be able to help explain doctrine. They won't get it. They're yeah. spiritually discerned. Yeah. So you have to build that up in order. You're building a house. Um, and now as, a, as a talker, it's very important that you announce the verses. If you're new to soul winning, you need to write out your plan. You can go to... Um, the, the Fort Worth website, steadfastbaptistkjv.org, and I will also uh, get it uploaded on your guys' as well. I don't know if it's on there or not. I can't remember. But um, it's how to go to heaven, right up in the corner, or you can just go slash salvation, and it gives you a whole set of the soul winning plan that Pastor Romero uses. The flow of verses and an explanation. You could also just go to Pastor Romero's Bible Way to Heaven YouTube video. And on YouTube, if you hit the little gear, there's information there. You can open the transcript and literally it has it typed out for you with a timestamp. Line by line, second by second, you can see exactly what he's saying. You can pause it. You can copy and paste and print it out. There's a lot you can do. So you need to mark your Bible as a new soul winner. Um, I don't do it anymore. Because I've used, typically I use the same Bible every time for soul winning. And I mean, when I just go like this, it's going right to Revelation. I can just blindly go to a certain area and it's going to flop open to that page, you know. And uh, it's good to know it though, because I don't have that Bible with me today. I brought a Bible with me. I gave it away before I made it up here. So I went soul winning yesterday with a New Testament. And there was a few times I'm like, uh, there it is. Okay, cool. Found it, you know. So it's, it's good to test yourself and use another Bible and not just get in the habit of, I know it's here somewhere. You know, but as you're starting, use those resources. Get the training wheels on. Highlight your verses. Right below there, the next verse you're going to go. Number one, all right? Romans 3.10 is where I start. Some start in 3.23. Number two, 3.23. Number three, Romans 6.23. Highlight it. Make it easy for them to read. Uh, it's, be, it's good to have them highlighted so you can actually show it to them so they can read it. That's, those are good things to have. Some people will have the little flags on their Bible. That is totally okay. That is 100% fine. Well, yeah, but if I have all these little bookmarks and flags and highlights and notes, the person at the door is going to think I'm an amateur. Doesn't matter. Yeah. They don't know. They th you're in charge. Yeah. You're sent out with authority, and they don't know how much you know. And if you have to take your time, hold on a minute. i get right to it. One second. They don't know. Right. Oh no, I forgot a verse. They don't know that. You're in charge. You're, you're, you know what I mean? You're showing them the path. So if you skip a verse, oh no, it messes up everything. No, it doesn't. Go back to it. Or if they're already on the path and it's okay, that verse, you've explained the, the concept without that verse, you're okay. If you feel the need where you're at, just go back to it. Just don't break the thought of the point that you're on. Because you have these checkpoints. Um, if you'll notice on the back here, are you 100% sure you will go to heaven? The Bible says... You must understand you're a sinner. Number two, you must understand that there's a penalty for sin. Number three, you must believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose, rose from the dead to give you eternal life. And number four, you can have eternal life and go to heaven when you die. Those are four points that some people use. Let's say there's four things you must understand. Uh, you can say there's a few things that you must understand because if you could take one and two and make it one point if you wanted. depends on your presentation and on your verses. But this is a good example of a checkpoint. This one verse, where you, you know, this one point has two or three verses to nail that one home and you just prove it. 
So in your own presentation, use those same techniques so you know where you're at, where you're going. Mark up your Bible, use notes, use the flags. Like I said, you're in charge. They have no idea if you mess up or miss something right. or if you're nervous. Just calm down, take a breath. Um, God sent us out. Now, I'm going to run you through a very basic introduction of what I do. Okay, um, I'm going to start with the intro, uh, probably deal with a little bit in the middle, then go to the end just for the sake of time. Um, here, I need a, I need a, uh, I need a test dummy. Hello. Hey, my name's Adam. I'm with Steadfast Baptist Church. You go to church and you, there's different ways you can do it. Usually what I say now is we're out preaching the gospel and inviting people to church. Do you go to church anywhere? No, not at all. You don't go anywhere? No. Did you used to go? When I was a kid. Cool. Okay. All right. What kind of church did you go to? Uh, a lot of churches, Baptist church from time to time. Okay. Now, some of those questions there are not necessary. Nope, you don't go to church? Okay, well, more important than going to church because that's where I'm going. Now, that's just being a little more personable. Mm. Yeah, I used to go to church. What kind of church was it? Latter-day Latter -day Satan worshipers? Oh, okay. I need to know that. That might come in handy. Yeah. Oh, Church of Christ. I know you're trusting in baptism. That comes in handy. Well, it was uh, Pentecostal. Oh, okay. You think you can lose your salvation and evidence of salvation is rolling on the floor and barking like a dog. That might come in handy, right? So that's why you can ask those questions to get more information. Uh, so are you 100, if you were to die today, are you, okay, let me back up. So the reason I start saying now is we're out inviting people to church and preaching the gospel is I'm foreshadowing the more important thing. Well, like I said, we're out preaching the gospel. Let me ask you this or another one. No, I'm a Christian. I'm a Baptist. I'm good. Well, cool. All right. That's good. Good to meet. But look, I can't let you off the hook just because you're a Christian. We're asking everybody this question. If you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven? Mm, yes. Sure. Yes. Okay. Do you think like maybe 50% or 75%? Mm, maybe 90. Maybe 90. That's okay. Good. All right. Now notice I'm not killing it right away. I, I want this guy to be my friend. But I'm not gonna, I don't, and I don't want to support his bad doctrine. So what I want to do is like, oh, okay, all right. I'm shaking my head yes. I'm smiling at his answers. I'm not shooting everything down right away. I want to, I'm building the house. I need to figure out what I need to do, right? Okay, maybe 90%. Well, let me ask you this, just kind of in your opinion. What do you think someone has to do to be able to go to heaven? Well, ask Jesus to come into your heart, go to church, read your Bible. Okay, all right. All those things. Ask him to come in your heart. stuff I probably don't do most Ooh. of the time. <laughs> okay, well, I appreciate you being honest with me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me ask you this. Do you think that um, being a good person has anything to do with going to heaven? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, definitely. What about keeping the commandments? Well, yeah. Being baptized? Of course. Going to church? Yeah, definitely. Okay, all right. Well, the Bible says something a little bit different. Can I show you what it says? Now, sometimes, even though they've already told me they're not sure and they have to do works, I'm still going to ask an eternal security question. The old IFB does not preach eternal security in the gospel. And hey, I don't think that's the gospel. I, this is very important. Well, let me ask you. Okay, so you've got to keep do the works, go to church. Um, do you think there's anything that you could do that you would lose your salvation? Oh, I'm sure there's got to be. Yeah. Like what? Like what do you think? Murder. Murder? Oh yeah. Yeah, rape. That's pretty bad. Yeah. Okay. Well, the Bible says something a little bit different. Can I show you what it says? Please. Now, I'm making an objection. I'm drawing a line in the sand. I'm not saying I'm over here with you. We're on the same side. I'm saying I'm over here and you're over there. There's something different. This is very important, I believe. Can I show you what it says? Yes. Well, how long is it going to take? Now, I do not say it'll only take five minutes, right. I promise. I try to avoid saying how long it'll take. I try to avoid saying it'll only be a few minutes. Because when I get talking, it takes 30, 40 minutes, okay? I want to be very thorough in my presentation. Look, you can do it in less. You can, I've had, I mean, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. I prefer to take 30 to 40 minutes so I know that the job is done right. Amen. So I don't want to lie to them and say, I promise it'll only be 10 minutes. I don't even mention the time. If they say, well, how much, how long is this going to take? Well... It depends on you how many questions you have. 
But the verses I want to show you that are most important are probably 10 to 15 minutes. Is that okay? All right, because really, it, you're going to get some interaction from them. And you may have them cut you off in the middle anyway. It depends on you know, what their timing issue is. So the first thing I'll say is, um, so, so I know I've got these tie downs. He says he has to go to church. He says he has to be a good person. It's important to repeat those things because I'm going to say them again. Mm -hmm. So you're about 90% sure, okay, you think you have to be a good person. Okay, all right. Well, the Bible says something different. Can I show you what it says? Now, the first thing that you have to recognize, and I begin the presentation, I start in Romans chapter 3, verse number 10, is that no one is perfect. Now, I'm foreshadowing giving definitions to words that they may not be familiar with. No one is perfect. No one deserves to go to heaven. Mm. In Romans chapter 3, verse number 10, the Bible reads, and now when you get good, you can just hold it and, and quote it because you've said it over and over and over, right? But sometimes you need to do that, and that's okay. The Bible says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Mm. Now, righteous means to always do the right thing mm. or to be perfect. Are you a perfect person? Mm, no. No? <laughs> you think I'm a perfect person? No. No. You know some people that think they're perfect? Yes. Yeah, right? <laughs> now, this is where I, personally, I use a little bit of humor. That's not necessary. Some people don't even go to this verse. I like it because I want to lighten the mood and get them to drop their guard a little bit. Mm. At this point, they're like, there's some religious person here. They're backing me in a the corner. They're saying I'm wrong. Look, I want to be your friend. But I'm not coming over to your side and agreeing with you 100%. I'm gonna, I want to be your friend by showing you the truth. Amen. You know? You know, people who think, of course, Ariel, I know some people like that, you know. So the Bible says that nobody's perfect. No one is righteous enough to get to heaven. Mm. And what I'm doing is I'm defining these words for them. Some people would say, well, do you know what righteous is? And I used to do that, and that's not necessarily wrong. But you, you're usually going to get a wrong answer. Yeah. You're usually going to get a wrong answer. <clears throat> Don't ask questions if you're always getting the wrong answer. Ask the questions to really find out what they believe, especially words that don't necessarily matter. Now, the next verse in the same chapter, it actually says, now listen, as a talker, if you have a silent partner that's trying to learn, it is your responsibility to announce the verses and to check on your silent partner. So here's my silent partner over here. I'm talking to you. I'm dialed in here. I don't want you talking on your phone. I don't want you watching traffic. If they look to you for confirmation, it's your job to look at the Bible because that's what I want them to do. Mm -hmm. I want you to look at me, at my eyes, because they're going to there's things I'm saying that I don't see it. They're going to look at my silent partner. Right. And if my silent partner is watching this, you know, picking his nose, watching Facebook, that's the reaction. They're going right. to mirror that. Right. So as a silent partner, when the person looks at you, you need to look at the Bible because I'm probably already reading it. Look down and then they will follow your eyes. Okay. Yeah. You need to confirm these things. So, verse 23. So, in the same chapter, Romans 3.23, the Bible reads, so, you know, check up on them. Make sure, make sure they're, they're flipping with you. Nothing bothers me more when I get somebody that wants to be a silent partner and they don't even have a Bible. That bothers me. Well, I want to be a talker. Well, then where's your sword? Yeah, right. I want to get in the fight one day. I just, you know, we'll start using your sword. Get used to it. Right. You know? doesn't make any sense. So make sure your silent partner has a Bible. Make sure they're along. Even if it's a New Testament, get them on board. Get them behind you. Okay? So 323, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible's saying we've all sinned. Now, you know what sin is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In your own words, how do you define sin? Lying, stealing. Not so much doing things like naming doing. sins, but what do you think sin is? Just doing things that I'm not supposed to do. That's exactly right. Now, notice what I'm doing here. That's exactly right. The Bible says sin is a transgression of the law. Right. I can go to 1 John and read it for him. I don't do that anymore. Right. I want to cut that out. Why? Because I'm, I'm trying to be efficient. What did he say once when you do something wrong? That's 95% right. right. That's 90% right. But it's the same concept. That's exactly right. Now, what am I doing? I'm encouraging them because I just told them they were wrong already. Right. Sin is a transgression of the law. A sin is when we break God's law. Now let me ask you something. If I run that stop sign out there, is that God's law or man's law? Man's law. Yeah. Now if I lie to you, whose law is that? God's law. That's right, yeah. Now if I run that stop sign, there's a punishment for that, right? There is. Yeah, like 
get a ticket or something, right? But do you know what the punishment is for breaking God's law? No. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm bridging, I'm foreshadowing to my next verse. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me show you. A lot of people at this point will go, go to hell. I, it will blow your mind how many people this early in the presentation will say, go to hell. If you get that answer, this is somebody you can work with. Amen. All right. If you don't, that doesn't mean they're, they're, it's possible to work with them. But right. this is very, very good because they know they deserve hell. They're just being honest. Right. Yeah. Go to hell. Yeah. That's right. Let me show you what the Bible says. Look. So in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, check it on your silent partner. <laughs> For the wages of sin is death. Now, I stop right there personally on this verse, and I'll show you why, because I'm going to come back to it. I, I used to ask, do you know what wages are? Yes. And I used to get yes, no, I don't know, like gambling, not wager, <laughs> wages. So I, I define wages for them. Mm -hmm. Wages are something you earn, like minimum wage or an hourly wage. Most people get that. At that point, they're like, oh, yeah, of course, wages. I get it. I've heard that minimum wage, hourly wage. <coughs> for instance, if you asked me for $20 and I said, sure, mow my lawn or sure, clean my truck. If you did it, I would have to give it to you. You would earn it. That would be your wage. Now, what I'm also doing here is I'm presenting the wages of sin is death. When you sin, you earn health. So again, I'm foreshadowing with my definition. There's other definitions I could use of wage, but I'm narrowing the definition to help them understand you did something, you're going to get something, right? So if you cleaned out my truck, I would have to give you that $20. You earned it. Right. Does that make sense? And I'm, I'm, I'm foreshadowing what I'm about to tell them <clears throat> because of your sin. So I go back to it. So the wages of sin is death. Sin is when you break God's law. Wages are something you earn. So we have, because we've sinned, we have earned death. Mm. Now, at this point, most people will say, have you heard of the second death? And that's a fine transition. I've added a little bit here on mine personally. And I will say the death. Now, it's not just talking about the death of your body. There's something about you that will last forever. And I can't see it. Do you know what it is? Right. Soul. Soul. That's absolutely right. Now, at this point, if they say spirit or soul... I accept either one as the right. correct answer, and I do the same thing. That's exactly right. I give them a gold star. Okay? This is important. I want them on my side. I want them to feel like they're moving forward. They're earning. They're, they're growing in knowledge as we go through. Well, the spirit? That's exactly right. The Bible teaches that the spirit and the soul will last forever, either in heaven or in hell. So what am I doing also here? I'm foreshadowing again hell. The second. Then I'll say... By the way, have you heard of the second death? Mm -mm. As I flip to it. Now, in my, in my handy Bible, I would have already been there without even looking. I'm boom, right? right. So, Revelation 20, 14 is the next place we're going to go. And again, it's very important that you show the verses to them because this is the foundation. I could probably quote it all to you, and I have, and I could probably paraphrase and connect all the dots, and I've had to do it, and it's good to be able to do that. When I've had people that, no, 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 don't open that Bible. Well, you know, it says this, and I start getting into my presentation just by quoting and quoting and quoting. And I say, here, let me just show you. No, 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 I don't have time. Man, you know. <laughs> so it's good to, to get to that point. But until then, get in the habit of going there because, uh, and I say this later at a particular point, and I'll show that to you. Um, I, I want you to see it from the Bible so that you know this isn't just my opinion. Right. Right. This is the Word of God because people will accept it as truth. So, Revelation chapter 20, verse number 14, the Bible reads, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So, what the Bible is teaching here is that when you die and go to hell, it's like a second death. Now, there's deeper doctrine here. The lake of fire is different than hell. Now is not the time to disciple on that. Now, don't even bring it up. I've had one out of maybe 300 people bring it up. Right. I've only, I mean, in, in several years, I've only had a very few people ever bring it up. And I'm like, that's right, you know. But yet they're not saved. Yeah. Otherwise, we wouldn't be this far along. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So telling that to somebody, I'm trying to get saved, isn't really going to help them necessarily. Right. 
but you know the answer, and that's good. And it's not that you're withholding information. Discipleship comes after salvation. We're building the house. So, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So the Bible teaches, for our sin, we deserve to die and go to hell. Mm. Or usually what I'll do is point, and I'll say, so according to the Bible, what do we deserve for our sin? And I point at death and hell. Mm -hmm. And I'd be quiet. What do we deserve for our sin? Hell. Yeah, death and hell. A lot of times they'll say, death. And I'll say, and? Mm -hmm. What do we deserve? And I'll do this throughout the presentation a few times. I personally say, death and hell, half a dozen times in my presentation. And I try to get them to say it to me because I'm building, I'm, I'm building a house. I want that in the foundation that they deserve hell and that Jesus went to hell for them. So I'm going to get back to that one. So I'm foreshadowing the fact that I'll prove that Jesus went to hell at a certain point. Now look, God loves you. He doesn't want you to go to hell, does he? Mm. No. no, of course not. But not everybody gets to go to heaven either, do they? And no, and, and, but I'll show you the difference. I want you to see the difference. And I'll read the next verse. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God has a book. And if your name is written in it when you die, you go to heaven. If not, where do you go? Hell. And a lot of times people... Mm, yeah, they you don't know? say it. <laughs> and you can say, yeah, hell. Right. Yeah, come up, make sure, you know. Why? Because they have to agree and understand they need to be saved. So here's a list of some people that deserve to go to hell. Revelation 21, verse number 8. The Bible reads, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable... Now, I mentioned this in the sermon on Thursday, that if you think you're dealing with a pervert, and they're listening, and they want to talk, and because listen, some people just want to talk. They'll let you talk all day just to fill a void, because they got yeah. nothing going on. Abominable. Do you know what an abomination is? Mm -mm. Homosexuals, child molesters, perverts. Mm. So you're throwing that out there. You're, you're connecting a homo with a child molester. You're one and the same in God's book, is what you do. You're like trying to find out, like, and now what will happen? You can kind of watch their eyes, and they might, like, like okay, right. something's going on here, right? Later, they might bring it back up. They might bring it up immediately or in a few minutes. I've had it go both ways. Well, I am one. And I always say, what, a child molester? <laughs> no, 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 a homosexual. Oh, okay. All right, well, here. Let me have that invite back. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't like our church. I'm out of here. That's not the place to rebuke them and get in a fight. Yeah. It's not. And the more you interact, the more you're not going to solve anything. You're not going to fix anything. And I've had, I've had them chase me down the road and get in a fight with me physically. It finished nothing. They, he went and got his mama and his dyke sister and came down and chased me down on the road with other soul winners and, yeah, kicking at us in the whole nine yards. Accomplished nothing. We wrestle not with flesh and blood. Amen. I mean, what am I going to do? Whoop up on them? Oh, I showed them. Yeah, now I'm in the news for what? Yeah. I'm preaching the gospel? Come on. Yeah. Look, it's not important. But don't waste your time, and you can use that to evaluate and judge and try to find, you know, because you know, if they're, oh, come on, I into my house. Well, uh... Going into houses is something that is optional. This is why we go two by two. Mm -hmm. if, if you and I are there and we have another team that's looking for us and the situation might be questionable, I would say, hey, uh, silent partner, I want you to leave your Bible on the doorstep so our teammates know where we're at as we go inside. All right, Single guy with no partner going into a lady's house, mm -hmm. don't let it happen. Yep. Okay. Teenage boys going into some weird old dude's house, don't let it happen. Right. All right. Generally speaking, children that go soul winning, even the older ones, don't go into houses. No. Do not let it happen. If you're a grown man and, and you're ready to get in a fight if you have to, fine, go ahead. Yeah, right. You know, personally, I tell my wife, don't go into the house. Now, if it's if she opens the door and it's a lady with babies and she's there with her babies, go on in. That makes sense. That's okay. If it's a grandma, oh, bring your children in. I'll give them cookies. Cool. Can I preach the gospel to you? Go ahead. Do that. Amen. You know, so I mean, use some discernment in this. This is very important. So in Revelation 21, so I don't always do that about abomination, mm -hmm. but it's there if you need it. The fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, mm. 
Now, Ken, how many people have you killed this year? None yet. Be sure? I mean, you kind of look, you know. Now, look, again, I use some humor because they're laughing. Yeah. <laughs> Murder, yeah, you know. I mean, you right. look kind of tough, man. I'm just saying, you know, you should do something about that beard. You're scary. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't go that far. <laughs> but you would agree, murderers, they deserve to go to hell, right? Right, yeah. Okay, so what I do, I get them on my side. I get them back to the point of why we're reading this verse. They deserve to go to hell, right? And whoremongers. I used to define this differently. What I do now is I say it the same way every time. A whoremonger is somebody that sleeps around that's not married. And I move on. Sorcerers. It's like magic or witchcraft. Mm. Harry Potter. Mm. Right? Sometimes I'll say God hates that. But I want him to know. Right? This is a list of people that deserve to go to hell. I've already said it twice. Um, idolaters. It's like worshiping statues. And all liars. Uh oh. Mm. You ever told a lie? Yes. Yeah, me too. Right? We all have. But look what the Bible says. Now, I do that the same way every time because I want them to agree that they're a liar. There's other ways you can do it. You can go back and say, he that maketh a lie. I don't have a problem with that if you're doing it. This is just how I do it with liars. You told lie. Yeah, me too. Everyone has. Look what the Bible says. And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So I go, uh-oh. Now, just a minute ago, I had him laughing because I called him a murderer. But now they're admitting to being a liar. Uh-oh, right? So according to the Bible, even though you're not a murderer, but you have broken God's law. Mm -hmm. According to the Bible, if you got what you deserved, where would you go when you die? Hell. Hell, that's right. So what is the punishment for our sin? Death and hell. Mm -hmm. Now that's the bad news, and it's important to understand that. But let me show you the good news. This is our transition. The frequency you should change in your voice. You should, this is upbeat. This is positive. This is encouraging. I just took them to the point where they've half a dozen times said, yeah, I deserve hell, I deserve hell, I deserve hell. Because at this point, if they say, I don't think, well, I don't think I've done anything bad enough. Well, you need to deal with that. You have to get them tied down, and that's my checkpoint at hell. If I can't get them to agree that they need hell, I'll never leave Revelation. Usually I'll also say, <clears throat> how long do you think hell lasts for? Almost everybody, forever, eternal. Yeah, that's right. And then I quote Revelation 14, and if you want, you can take them to verses 10 and 11. I quote a portion of 11, and it says that the smoke of their torment, that's like torture, mm -hmm. ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night. Yeah. <laughs> you and I were resting last night asleep. Meanwhile, there were people on fire in hell being tormented for their sin. Mm -hmm. And they don't get a break, they don't get out. It's very serious. So it's important to nail that down. Hell is real. Hell lasts forever. You don't get out. You know, so that way that would kind of uh, rattle the bush. And if they believe in a soul sleep, you can get them. Um, you can deal with that there. Okay. So after I have them dealing with hell, I go back to Romans six twenty three. I realize a lot of people. You may go back to. You may go do all of six twenty three, and then go to Romans five eight. There's a couple ways you can do it. This is just how I do it. I can still use Romans 5, 8 in my method before and after, before or after, or not at all. So it's up to you how your flow goes. Do what works for you, okay? It says, and you can quote Romans 5, 8 as well. You don't necessarily have to turn there. I bring them back. I said, so remember we read this, for the wages of sin is death. We've mm -hmm. broken God's law. We earn death. Here's the good news. But the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. God wants to give you a gift. And he calls it eternal life. How long does eternal life last for? Forever. Forever. Mm -hmm. I gave him the first word of the answer. I'm trying to help him. I'm not leading him. I'm not going to give him the answer. I want a sincere answer. Now, forever. So, is that like a hundred years and then it stops? Mm -mm. It's eternity. Is it like a million years and then it stops? Mm -mm. What about if you sin again? Mm -hmm. Get them thinking. I want, I'll get all sorts of answers here. Usually wrong answers, sometimes right answers. I'm, there's two things that I really focus on in my presentation. Everlasting gift. Amen. Everlasting gift. They have to believe Jesus is God. Every presentation is going to have that. Every presentation of mine will have certain verses. But as I'm reading certain verses and I look up and I feel like they're not really with me and they're not getting it, I get a wrong answer down the road. I'm going to go back to 
It's a free gift and it lasts forever. This is where your illustrations are very handy. You know, the, hey, if I were to give you a gift, this Bible, I said, this is a, probably a $30 Bible. I tell you what, I promise you, you can have it for free. You can keep it forever. These words I'm using are very particular, and I'll show you why in a second. I promise you, you can have it for free. You can keep it forever. And here you go. What do you have to do to get it? Just go ahead and take it as an example. Go ahead. Now, Ken, whose Bible is that? Mine. What did you have to do to get it? Reach out and grab it. Did you have to be a good person? Well, no. Let me ask you this. I'll take it back. What if I said, this is a $30 Bible. I promise you, you can have it forever. You can keep it for, you can have it for free. You can keep it forever. Just give me two bucks. Mm, no, that wouldn't be free. So it's not a gift, right? No. Why? Because I had to pay for it. I had to pay for it. Yeah. What if I said, here you go. You can have it. It's a free gift. You can keep it forever. Mm -hmm. Don't give me any money but I need you to wash my truck. Still not free. Why not? Because it was work that I did for it. Most people say, you're doing something for it. And you say, that's right, you're working for it. So if you don't get them to say work initially, you build that, that's where you're going with it. You're trying to help them understand, right? So what about this? I say, okay, here you go, it's yours. I promise you, you can keep it forever. It's totally free, you don't have to do anything to keep it. Go ahead and take it. Now, whose is it? Mine. Now, what if I found out, and you can use, there's different ways you can do this next part. What if I find out a year from now that you're talking bad about me? Mm. And you don't like me anymore, or whatever. I found out you did something terrible. Can I come into your house and just take it back? Uh, I guess. If I promised it was yours and you could keep it forever. Yeah. If I promised you, can I just come into your house? No. No, of course not. Now, if I made you that promise and I broke that promise, what would you call me? Liar. A liar. I, and so the reasoning I asked us to get that way is because I used to always get Indian giver. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> if you use the word promise, 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 and then break promise, you'll usually get the answer of liar. Yeah. That's what I'm built. That's what I'm foreshadowing. So I, by emphasizing on that, I get what I want and I help them understand it better. Instead of just saying, if I gave it to you and I took it back, give, take back. Indian giver. Right. Right? <clears throat> promise, break promise, liar. See what I'm saying? Just the same concept, different formula. And then you always take the first Tim, uh, Titus chapter 1, verse number 2. In, well, that's right. Now, do you think God can lie? As I begin turning. Titus 1, chapter 2, right? Most people say no. And I say, that's right. God can do anything he wants except lie. In Titus chapter 1, verse number 2, it says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So this is where, as you're making this foundation of what a gift is and how it is everlasting, that's, that's a really good illustration. And some people break it into two illustrations. However you do it, it I, I recommend doing it. Yeah. Uh, there's a young man in my church that's a good soul winner. And uh, he and I had not been out in a long time. We go out together. And he's like, yeah, you use the gift illustration. So does so-and-so. And I'm like, you don't? You need to get on that. You need to use that because this is an illustration to connect the dots. Look, I can open up the Bible and read it to you. And that's not really teaching or preaching. That's just reading. I'm supposed to read a verse, teach you what it means, preach to you what that means to you and what you have to do with it. Well, it's the same way at the door. Read this verse, read that verse, read this verse. Do you agree? Let's pray. Right. That's not soul winning. That's right. Okay. And that's where the old IFB is disconnected because they feel unequipped, unconfident. They're not sure of themselves. And all they know is they got these few verses. Look, we're here to fix the problem. We're here yeah. to troubleshoot the person. If you're a plumber and you show up at their house and it's like, you just, okay, did you check this? Did you check that? You know what I mean? You're going to troubleshoot them. You want to know, is there water in the floor? Well, okay, is it coming from upstairs? Is it coming from the bathroom? There's questions you have to ask and figure it out. The old IFB totally fails at soul winning because of that. And, and don't get me wrong. Hey, there's some good old IFB soul winners. And I, I thank God for the men generations past that did it right. But they're, they weren't training up soul winners. Right, right. You know, and, and, and thank God that we have something a little bit different today, that we're actually getting serious about it. Uh, I want to skip ahead a little bit. We're not going to do the entire presentation for the sake of time today. One of the things I do whenever I'm at John 3.16, I ask about who Jesus is. I get them to tell me about Jesus. Um, I find out if they believe that he's God. I ask, do you think Jesus is God? Uh, that's where these stickers come in handy. Find out where they believe, what they believe, and deal with that then and there. Um, then I deal with the resurrection. 
And he died, he, they literally, they whipped him, they beat him. You explained how he worked miracles, he raised the dead, he forgave sins. You tell him the story of Jesus. Um, and that's an important part of your, your soul winning gospel also. You know, you ought to, I would encourage, I had a good friend that, that made the recommendation for, for new believers or preachers even to write down what they're saying in between the verses. If I write out my presentation, I say, well, I'm just going to write Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Revelation 20.14, 20, 20.15, 21.8. I can just write those numbers down. And he's saying, write those down and then write what happens in between them. Because that should always be the same. This is your opportunity to self-analyze and see if you're really bridging the verses and teaching the doctrine. Right. Yeah. And sometimes by writing it down, You'll say, well, I say it this way sometimes, I say it that way, but as I'm writing it down, I think this is the better way. Mm. Now you can set it in stone and you're seeing it, you're reading it, you're writing it, and you can ingrain it in your memory, and then your soul winning will get better. So that's a really good recommendation I have, especially on your resurrection story. We have to understand that he's God, he worked miracles, he died and rose again. This is an essential part of the gospel. So, you know, how that how ended right, he preached the truth, and the religious, you know, the Jews killed him. Uh, they beat him, they whipped him, they pulled, they plucked his beard out of his face. They, and then I always, they literally nailed him to a cross in his hands and his feet. And he died there. Now, he being God, he could have stopped it at any moment. He could have called fire down from heaven. He could have snapped his fingers and had angels come down. But he didn't. Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. You know anybody that would take a bullet for you? No. And that's kind of what Jesus did for you, spiritually speaking. He took the punishment of your sins. Now, you know the story. He died on the cross. They took his body down and put it in the grave. But what happened three days later? He came back. He came back. Came back. Yeah. He, he rose again. He resurrected. You believe he came back to life? Right. So, you know, make sure if the, if the answer is vague to nail him down on that. But let me ask you this. Jesus was God and, you know, he was man also. Where do you think his soul went for those three days? Heaven. Heaven, because he's perfect, right? Yeah. But now, why did he die? Uh, for our sins. And what is the punishment for our sins? Death and hell. And hell. And at that point, a lot of times with people, I get a real aha of like, oh. Because mm -hmm. yeah. they know I deserve hell. And they know Jesus died for their sins. And it's almost <laughs> like it doesn't compute. Right. Oh, I deserve death and hell. He died and went to hell for my sins. That computes. Right. I've had a lot of people that really just like, oh, wow, that makes sense. I said, let me show you this from the Bible so you know it's not my opinion. Right. The Bible reads in Acts chapter 2, verse 31, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. His flesh didn't corrupt because his body didn't decompose. He rose again in three days. But it says his soul was not left in hell. You and I deserve to die and go to hell for our sin. If we got, and hell is forever. Jesus went to hell for us and took our punishment. He conquered death and hell and rose again, thereby giving us victory. So, so you could say, you, know, you give you a get out of hell free card. I don't really use that that often, but you can if it needs to help connect the dots. But you're teaching them, hey, you deserve to burn. He burned for you. That's very important. A good follow-up verse on that, I don't always use it, but it, it helps connect the, the dots, is uh, John 5, 24. Uh, especially with my presentation, because I'll usually go John 3, 16, 3, 18, 3, 36, and then um, you can go 5, 24, 6, 47. But again, those are ones to know, but not necessarily use all the time. Those are ones to be ready to go to, but don't feel that you have to say them every time. Okay, But John... 524, after I've just said that he rose again, he caught, now he went to hell so we don't have to. I explained, so our sin was put on him, he went to hell. His righteousness is put on us. His perfection is put on us. So when the Father looks down, he doesn't see our sin. He sees the perfection of Jesus Christ. John 524, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, that's what you're doing right now, and believeth on him that sent me, Half everlasting life. That means you have it right now. And shall not come into condemnation. Now I've already explained that in 3.18. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll, re I'll hit it again while I'm here. But is passed from death unto life. Mm -hmm. 
By believing on Jesus, you deserve to go to hell. He went for you. Now you're past him to ever eternal life. Mm-hmm. Usually by that point in my presentation, they really get it. They've got everything like, wow, that's big, you know. And, and I have the checkpoints all the way through. And that's why, and then you can use like uh, the good guy, bad guy illustration. Are you guys familiar with that one? And so so that, say there's two guys standing on the porch here. A good guy and a bad guy. And when I say bad guy, I always talk, look at my silent partner. You know, <laughs> throw him under the bus. <laughs> and let's say that one's a good guy and one's a bad guy. You can do it the other way. You could say bad first. But let's, let's say the bad guy, let's say, you know, um, he, he doesn't take care of his family. Maybe he does drugs. He's not living right. But in his heart, he's trusting Jesus that he died for his sins so he can go to heaven. When he dies, where would he go? Heaven. Now, what about the good guy? There's a good guy, and let's say he pays his bills, he takes care of his family, he feeds the poor, he goes to church every Sunday, he puts money in the offering plate. But in his heart, he believes he's good enough. He's doing the good works. When he dies, where will he go? No. So that's an illustration you can use. And you can expound on how you describe the good guy, bad guy, <laughs> make it more personable. You know what I mean? That's good. You know. Um, as for the ending of the presentation, once you've ran them through the checkpoints, you know that they're really on board um, in, at certain points. And that's a little bit different than what you said before, isn't it? Yes. You see how that's different? Okay. So then... I'll say, now the very first verse we went to when we started was Romans 3.10, where it says, there are none righteous, no, not one. I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, we are not good enough to get into heaven. But I want to show you this verse in Romans 10.10. So I'm building from 3.10 to 10.10, and I read the first half of the verse. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Now I've done my job, I've explained Believe, believe, believe. It means faith. It means to trust alone. I've done, I've done all of that before I get to this point. This is the end. I'm skipping a lot in my presentation. but So it says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. So the Bible is saying, If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that He is your Savior, He's your God, He's the only way you're getting to heaven. If you believe that, when the Father looks down at you, He sees you like you are perfect. Mm-hmm. So again, I'm, I'm imputed righteousness without necessarily using the term. Unless they're an accountant, they might not even know what imputed means. Um, and obviously there's a lot of, a lot we're skipping here, Acts 16, and there's a lot of things that you can, you know, your presentation may differ slightly from mine. So I'm giving you the beginning, a little bit in the middle, just about the resurrection, and I'm giving you the very tail end, how I land the plane, okay? Um, and when I'm getting close to this point, I'll say we're almost done here. Mm-hmm. And that will usually, they'll relax a little when you tell them we're almost done. When I'm going here, I'll say, last thing, well, check this out, you're going to like this. You know, sometimes I'll tell them that about verses. That's okay. Just, that's just who I am. When I knock on your door, hey, how y'all doing? Look, I have a Bible, a track, and an open hand. Hey, how y'all doing? And a smile. And that's how I talk. You can make fun of me for saying y'all if you want, but that's me, and I'm not going to change. I'm like, hello, sir, I'm with Steadfast Baptist. We are proper, no, hey, man, that's me. Amen. Right? If they're, if they're kids that are dressed like... Like punks. Hey, what's up, y'all? Yeah. Right. Come here. Let me talk to you for a second. Come on over. Now, come here real quick. You got to see this. Be real. Yeah. Excuse. Pardon me, sir. No, come on. Nobody wants to talk to that. <laughs> be yourself, right? Be proper. Be, be, you know, authoritative. You're the boss. If you let them control the conversation, you've already lost. Yeah. yeah. Um, excuse me. Do you mind? Can I have uh, just a second? I'd like to. No, I mean, you're already. Forget it. Go out in confidence. And I know, I understand. Well, I don't know all the verses. Brother Fan, I, don't, I couldn't do what you do. doesn't matter. You don't, you're not called to do what I do. Right. You're called to do what God's given you. Amen. And you've got the basic verses. You have them written down. You've got the Holy Spirit. And God's not going to send you to a five-point Calvinist. God's going to send you to somebody that thinks they're already saved, but they think they can lose it. Right. And you need to nail down eternal security. Amen. And when they get it, they'll get saved. He's going to send you to the people you can handle. And when there's people you can't handle, that's a learning opportunity. Man, I had this person. They kept saying that you have to have a relationship. And, they, and we had one yesterday, didn't we? Boy, these guys, something else. We, we stayed with them longer than we should have because the one roommate got saved. The other two picked a fight. 
One of the roommates was there the whole time and heard everything. The other one came in late. And one of the like, well, well, but don't you love God? Well, isn't that like having a relationship? And I kept going back to, you know, uh, John 1, 12, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I'm a son of God because I believed. And guess what my dad does when he corrects me? He whoops me. Right. If you talk to your dad and he tells you to do something and you disobey him, you slam the door and say, I'm not cleaning my room. Is he still your dad? Of course. Now, does he correct you or does he kick you out of the family? Well, it's the same way with God. <coughs> Our punishment is in the flesh when we break God's law. He's not going to take away salvation and throw us in hell. He'd be breaking his promise. Right? We've already put that foundation out. Right. And, and not to mention in a relationship. Well, but you, that's a relationship, isn't it? Hey, you don't know my father. You don't have a relationship with my father. You have a relationship with somebody else. So, no, salvation is not a relationship. You don't, you don't even know who my dad is. You can't have a relationship with him. You don't know his cell phone number. You don't know his middle name, so forget about it. Right? You know, but you know, you're telling them, hey, it's not about a relationship. You have to break that down. And if they're stuck on it, well, it might not be for them. Yeah. You know. Um, so I'll, I'll do that Romans 10, 10, half of the verse, and then I'll go back up to verse number nine and read all of nine, all of ten, sometimes eleven if there's other people present that are not on board. And verse number eleven reads, uh, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Mm. Now, to be totally accurate, this is talking about ashamed at judgment. I don't want to be ashamed when I stand before God right. for a lack of salvation or for a lack of works, lack of rewards now that I am saved. So there's a multiple applications here. I use it for, there's the door open, the friends there, the wife's there, they're not really listening, but they've been kind of paying attention. Well, are you ashamed? Right. To say that you believe Jesus is God. That you deserve, you deserve hell, but he died and went to hell for you, mm. so you can go to heaven. Are you ashamed to say that? No. So what I'm doing, I'm calling them out on the carpet. This is a decision time. <clears throat> right. Let's, let's see where you're at. And then obviously verse number 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So how do we call God? And I always do this. Do we pick up the phone? Mm. And they always say no. We talk to him. We pray to him. That's right. And then this is very key, what I say here. Do not ever force somebody to pray. I've heard people do this and I don't like it. Mm -hmm. Okay, just pray. Say this. Yeah, right. That's wrong. Let me help you tell God you've changed your mind and Amen. you want your name in the book of life. Let's mark it down now. You want to be saved, even just, you know. Yeah, and the, well, no, I'm already saved. Good. Let's get this objection out of the way before I pray with you. Right. You see what I'm saying? Because uh, too many people, oh, let's just pray and then. You could ask, so, if I don't see you in church, where am I going to see you? I don't know. The grocery right. store? Right. If you die tomorrow, where are you going? Uh, I don't know. It's a good question. Well, oh, you failed. Right. That's what right. the checkpoints are for. They're to keep you on track. It's to help make sure they're actually learning. Because you know where you're going. You know where you want them to go. So you have these waypoints every so often. You've got mile markers on the road, right? You know where you're going. You know, you know how to get there. So it's very important to have these checkpoints all throughout. Are there any questions? I appreciate your help. Mm. Any questions about beginning, ending, anything in the middle, just generally speaking, anything you've wondered or how to handle certain objections? Go ahead. I may have missed it, but how did you transition from, you went, you were talking about uh, Romans 6.23 and you, you showed the bad part, went through Revelation, you came back, you showed the second half, the gift, and, and so from that point, is that when you transition into... That's when I go to the Christ? meat of my gospel. Um, you can go Romans 5, 8, Acts 16. You can go, some, you can go from Romans 6, 23 because it talks about the gift of God. God wants to buy you a gift and Jesus paid for it. Um, let me show you another verse that talks about it being the gift of God. And go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And then transition back to Romans 5, 8 or Acts 16. How you transition is up to you. And sometimes I'll do it slightly different, but I always end up in the same place. It's very important to understand. A lot of times as I'm turning to Acts 16, I'll say there's, uh, there's only one thing that you absolutely positively have to do to go to heaven. Let me show you what it says. Right? And then as I'm getting to the verse and I'm about to read it, I'll say, and so these guys, they're in prison and they said, they asked the question, what do I have to do to go to heaven? Now, is that what the verse says? What's the verse say? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
But now, what, again, what am I doing? I'm defining what they're about to hear. They're asking the question, what do I have to do to go to heaven? See right here? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe, and I emphasize it, and I pause, right. on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And I point at believe. I do the same thing in John 3.16. I point at believe, and I put it in their face, and I say, according to the Bible, what does it say you have to do to be able to go to heaven? And I be quiet until they answer the word believe. And I'll say, that's right, you have to have faith. You have to trust in Jesus. It says here, the Lord Jesus Christ. His name is Jesus, but the Lord is his title. He is God. If I haven't dealt with that yet, I do it then, or I'll come back to it, depending on, um, do you believe Jesus? Even if I've said it, he is God. Do you believe that he's God? Well, he's the son of God. I deal with it right there, even before John 3.16 sometimes. Um, Christ means Messiah. That means Savior of the world. He's the one that saves us from the punishment of our sin. So I'll define those terms as I go through. The transition, for me, does change sometimes, but only minutely. And, you know, I'm telling you, I'm trying not to be a hypocrite. I'm telling you to be consistent in how you do it. And if you're, if you're doing it a certain way from, if you come back to 623 and then go to 5.8 and then 16, stick with that. There's nothing wrong with it. If you go to 16 first, and then 5.8, and then 6.23, that's okay too. You see what I'm saying? As long as, as you're, you're laying this foundation that it's everlasting, it will never go away, and that it's a totally free gift, you can't earn it, and you don't have to do anything to keep it. I'll often ask the question, uh, you know, whenever you get a Christmas present, or a birthday present, and you open it up, do they put the receipt in there and make you pay them back? Right? Do your parents make you pay them back for the pr birthday present? Well, no, of course not, because then it wouldn't be a free gift. right? Because sometimes you'll say free gift, free gift, and they'll still say, well, yeah, you have to do something for it. Okay, let's use the word present for a second. Maybe that works better for your mind. Let's connect present and free gift. When you get a Christmas present, you open them up under the Christmas tree, and you open it up, and is, there the, is that the receipt you have to go pay for? No, of course not. You know, so use little illustrations or little stories like that just to help define the words. Because sometimes people are hung up on words they don't use that often. And it's not, it's not that they're idiots, it's that they're ignorant. And ignorance is repairable. Ignorance can be fixed with knowledge. Ignorance is good, especially when they're honest about being ignorant. Now, I don't know what that means. Great, thank you for telling I appreciate your honesty. No, man, I know for sure I wouldn't go to him. I appreciate your honesty. Does that make sense? You... Uh... So in my presentation, when, when I finally get to John 3.16, um, or, or I, so I, I, I talk about believing in Christ, I always, I always try to give, a, give an example or compare and contrast believing it and believing in it. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and is that something that, that you do? Sure, where you could say, um, I mean, I believe that George Washington existed, right, right. but I'm not trusting in him for right. anything. Right. Showing how believing is trusting. Yeah, where I'm cautious is, well, here it says believe on, and that's not believe in. Well, it does say believe in elsewhere. So I don't try to make them question on, in, uh, I don't want to confuse them. I want to keep it simple. So yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely. It's not just saying, yeah, I believe he existed. It's I'm trusting him for salvation. So you, you spend a lot of time on that? Because I tend to spend, and I may spend too much time on it. You think so? I, if yeah, you I, do, I it, but do you ever record I, yourself? No. Do it. Good. Get, um, almost every cell phone has a, an audio recorder feature. Stick it in your pocket. Start recording before you go to a door. It may record for 20 minutes before you get a presentation. But then... The next day or the next week, go back and listen to yourself. It's super important. It will help you. It really is. And I mean, really, even as an experienced soul winner, I should be doing this every three months just to check myself, just to see if I'm leaving something out. You know what I mean? I think, I think that's a good practice for anybody. Yeah, because if, you, if you're telling me you think you spend too much time on something, you probably do. Um, the, the idea of writing out what you're saying in between the verses, if you end up with a paragraph, be careful. Now, it's good to have the paragraph ready, but you should be able to say it in a few words. And if they get it in a few words and you're beating a dead horse, you might lose them. Yeah.
they, they might start to lose attention and then they're, then they're daydreaming and their focus is off and then you start go back to laying a foundation and they forgot what's going on. Right. Yes, sir. Um, when doing it in you as a science partner and you eventually come up to doing it in college books, um, what are some verses that we could pull to that directly uh, speak towards other faiths? I mean, just one or two real quick ones, like maybe one for Jehovah's Witnesses, one, just something that we can get a basis on. That, you know, right now, I can just Footnote right now, right now. Something you said, you're going to run into more religions than you are. Sure. Well, you can, you know, there's only one name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Um, usually what I do after reading John 3.16, I'll go to John 3.18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. I stop there and I define it, right? I, if, I, if I did a bad, if I, if I was wanted by the law, I wouldn't be condemned, whatever. You know, you can use an illustration to define condemned. I, I'm not guilty of my sin, essentially. If I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, I will not have to answer for any of my sin. It says that my sin is cast behind his back. It will not once be named unto me when I get to heaven. He's not going to tell me everything I did wrong. Uh, it is as far as the east is from the west. It's separated. But look at the rest of the verse. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the only name, or in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So, if your neighbor over here is a Muslim and they believe in Allah, will they go to heaven? If over here they're a Buddhist, if over here they're a Sikh, you can go as far with it as you want. So that one covers a lot. Of mm -hmm. Because what you're doing is nailing down Jesus only, Jesus, right. nothing else, Jesus only. And so that's a good point after John 3, 16 to make sure, oh, yeah, of course, Jesus, oh, yeah, yeah, Jesus, you know, but then it's like, okay, now that we've established that he is, that you believe that he's God, he is your savior, let's make sure you understand he is the only way, the one and only way, I've John 3, 18. I've heard a few times, but I haven't really experienced more or less people that are atheists as opposed to just, I have, you know, I'm a Buddhist and a Muslim, mm -hmm. so I figure when those do come up, I should have some. With atheists and agnostics, I've had a few that would claim that initially, and then later in the presentation, they tell me, I actually used to be a Baptist, I used to go to church, that sort of thing. Um, and when they tell me outright, I'm an atheist, I say, well, God doesn't believe in atheists. <laughs> and I just wait for a response. Because if it's going to get confrontational, let's get it out of the way. Amen. You know? Now, a lot of atheists, I'll just I'll appeal to their pride of knowledge. Well, you like to know things, right? I mean, you, you seem like an educated person. So let me ask you this. Do you know what the Bible says you have to do to be able to go to heaven? I already know what it says. I've read that whole thing. Well, what does it say? Tell me then. Yeah. Well, why don't you give me a few minutes, and I'll show you what it says, and you can make an educated decision. Then you'll know for sure. Right. Because imagine this. If I said, hey, I'm a Pepsi guy, and I only eat Pepsi. I'll, ne I'll never drink a Coke. Have you ever tried Coke? Nope, not even going to try it. Well, now, wait a minute. That'd be foolish. That's an uneducated decision. Right. Take the Pepsi challenge, right? <laughs> drink a Pepsi, drink a Coke, then make your decision. And I'll give you an opportunity. I'll, I'll show you what the Bible says, and then you'll know for a fact what it says, and then you can make an educated decision. I feel very old that I never read this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I remember the Pepsi challenge. I do too, man. <laughs> I never went back to Coke. At least you're educated. That's right. I was educated about it. So that's a good verse for a multitude of different faiths and beliefs because their core foundation is on a specific name of God as opposed to Jesus. And that's great. What are some of the uh, the lesser verses that would be referencing, referencing to other lesser faiths maybe that's still out there that are in uh, Um, I mean, you're going to run into certain religions. If they tell you up front they're a JW, it's probably not going to go anywhere. I, I'm still in JW. Uh, Jehovah's Witness. Oh, okay. Okay, they, they don't believe Jesus was God. They don't believe he died on a cross. He died on a stake. They don't believe he rose again. Um, their Bible, uh, the New World Translation, replaces the word Lord with Jehovah hundreds of times. Um, and they'll, that's what it says. He's Jehovah only. And there's certain verses they have. They have a lot of hang-ups. The Jehovah's Witnesses, the Seventh-day Adventists, they are very educated in a very small area. Right. Right. They've taken have, and ran with it. Well, they have get-togethers with presentations on DVD. Oh, yeah. A well-made presentation and a great narrator voice proving to you from their false Bible that if a Christian says this, that they're wrong. So they've got an answer for you. They're ready. Yeah, so, 
Yeah, well, so so there, when you run into them, that's a good opportunity to dig in a little bit deeper and find out what they believe and what they don't. And um, some of them, you know, they don't. I don't. I don't even think I'll go to heaven. I, I just want to be resurrected here, oh, yeah. right? So you know, uh, Seventh Day Adventists doesn't believe in hell. They believe in soul sleep. Uh, they'll say, well, it's just by faith alone, Seventh Day Adventist, to get saved. This is what they don't tell you to get saved. But then you have to keep the commandments, specifically the Sabbath. And if you don't, then you're not saved. And really, you shouldn't eat meat because if you do, you're not a spiritual person. And, you know, a lot, of, a lot of problems in different doctrines. And that's where asking the questions in the beginning is very helpful because then you might anticipate, oh, I'm going to have to deal with the Sabbath with this person and prove that Christ fulfilled that law in my presentation. <coughs> so a lot, of them, a lot of them, it is just something that um, you're only going to be able to do it by experience. By crossing that bridge, and man, now I got to get ready. I got to arm myself for this next battle. And there's there are things that if you don't use it, you'll forget it. There are certain religions I've prepared for that if I had to do it today, I could, I'd have to paraphrase the verse and I forget where it's at because I haven't used it in six months or a year. That's right. So generally speaking, that's why those checkpoints, John three sixteen, John three eighteen, is Jesus is the only way for me. That's what I use that for. Usually, those verses are going to point you to where they. Because the second half of the verse, when it says they're condemned already, I bring that back to hell. So if your your neighbor is a Muslim and they believe in Allah and not Jesus, when they die, where will they go? Or if your family member doesn't trust in Jesus for salvation, when they die, where will they go? You can do the same thing with uh, 336, where it says that uh, the wrath of God abideth on you. You know, it kind of, uh, John 336 says, a sim- says it a similar thing a different way. And I'll say, look at the last verse in the same chapter. And I'll go to 336, and um, the, that the wrath of God abides on them. Like, <laughs> that's not good. Wrath of God is not good. And they, they know that, and we're talking about hell. And it's kind of bringing it full circle.